continue our little mini sermon series here, going through the, the bread of life discourse here in John 6. Um, as we mentioned last week, this is kind of a little excursion out of the Gospel of Mark, which we've been focused on uh, for most of the year, uh, to sort of unpack a little bit, sort of take a moment. Mark's style is very, very fast and, and furious, going from one, uh, one thing to the next. But uh, John says, no, 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 let's, let's hang out here for a minute, because Jesus has something to say uh, in the wake of the feeding of the 5,000s, walking on the water and all of this. And so last week we talked about the fact that uh, Jesus says you can seek him, but you can seek him sometimes for the wrong reasons. Um, and we talked about that. What is it that they come to see when they go to see Jesus and, and chase after him? Um, and so in the wake of that, he then starts to talk about himself. He starts to talk about his mission and why he's here in the first place. And so that's what we're going to focus on today, uh, answering that question, who is Jesus? Sometimes we think we know the answer to such basic questions, but uh, when we, again, like John says, when we, we take a moment to pause and really reflect and think about that, uh, sometimes we realize, oh, maybe, maybe there's a little bit more there uh, to be gleaned. And so that's what we'll talk about here later today. Uh, but before we do that, as we come into the Lord's presence, it's important for us to reflect on who we are, uh, because we are not Jesus, we are not the Son of God, uh, we are broken, fallen, sinful people, and in the presence of a God that has great blessings for us, it's important that we recognize that, that we acknowledge that, that we repent, and that we turn to Him in faith. And so with that, uh, we open today with our hymn. Christ, whose glory fills the skies. Please rise, turn, and face the cross as we begin today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For our confession today, we'll read responsibly from Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. We confess to you, Lord, our mouths have not always praised you through our words, and we have boasted in things other than you. Help us humbly hear and be glad that we may taste and see that the Lord is good. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord. 
and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. We confess to you, Lord, we have sought after other things than you and have let our fears impede our faith. Give us hearts centered on you that we may taste and see that the Lord is good. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. We confess to you, Lord, our thoughts, words, and actions have not been faithful, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Hear us and save us from our troubles, that we may taste and see that the Lord is good. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. So as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, your blessed Son came down from heaven to be the true bread that gives life to the world. Grant that Christ, the bread of life, may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the readings. Our first reading today comes from the book of 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. King Ahab told Jezebel, his wife, all that Elijah the prophet had done, and how he had killed all of the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. And then he was afraid. And he arose, and he ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It's enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down, and he slept under the broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, 
the Mount of God. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle reading is from the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, where Paul writes, This I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. They have become callous. They have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That is not the way that you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to, be, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Now Jesus said to the crowds that chased him down and followed after him, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And so the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of this world is my flesh. This is the gospel of the Lord. May be seated. It's time we invite all the children present to come forward for the children's message. And if you brought your backpacks, bring them up here too.
Good morning, boys and girls. How are we doing? Guys doing well today? Right? Excited to be here. Excited, hopefully, for some other stuff that's happening this week, right? That's right. School starts this week. Yeah. But before we, before we get to that, okay, we have something else that we need to finish up, right? Just this summer is sort of coming to an end. Today, we get to finish talking about the Lord's Prayer, which we've been talking about for several weeks now, right? Going through that, we come to the last petition, the last part of the Lord's Prayer. So let's go through that prayer together, right? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. And then what comes after that? The last part that we're going to talk about today is, Nora? Let's go back. Let's go back, because you were about to say it, right? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's right. Deliver us from evil. So, as, so Jesus has given us this prayer and said, hey, when you pray, I want you to pray like this. And we go through all these other things. And then in the end, he says, you should pray to God that he would deliver us, deliver you out of evil situations, right? That he would help protect you, that he would help see you through those kinds of things, right? And I think that's an important thing for us to talk about and to think about, especially as we get ready to go back to school, right? Because school can be a little tricky sometimes, right? We got to leave home and go out and there's all these other people around and there's new teachers and new, new hallways and new classrooms and all that kind of stuff. It can be a little bit scary, right? But it can be pretty helpful, though, if you know that you go with Jesus behind you, right? As we pray that God would deliver us from evil. So let me ask you, right? Um, you guys brought your backpacks in, I see. Okay, all you got your backpacks. How are you feeling about starting school? You're excited? You're excited, right? Good, good. You got friends in your class. That's a great thing to be excited about, yeah. Awesome. And what grade are you going into now, Hunter? Second grade, all right. What about you, Levi? What grade are you going into? You don't know. I think you're going into kindergarten. That's a pretty big deal, right? Kindergarten, that's a huge deal. That's awesome. How, how do you feel about that, though? Excited? Yep. Only excited or maybe something else, too? Friends. Friends, yep, there's friends. Good, okay. Those are things to be excited about. What about you, girls? Are you, are you excited about the new school year or do you feel something else? Or you, got, you feel scared, a little bit scared? Why would you feel scared? That's right, yeah, you're going into a new grade. And what grade are you going into this year? First grade. First grade. Yeah, first grade, that's kind of a big change from kindergarten to first grade. You got all new subjects and things like that that are going in there. Yep, and then... That's right, that's good. It's good that you know, it's clear that you know some math there, right? Twelfth is the final one. It's good that you know that. Otherwise, we'd be here all day counting grades, right? So, yeah. But sometimes, though, when, it, when we get ready to start things like a new school year, okay, there can be some excitement there, but sometimes there can also be a little bit of fear, hesitation, right? Because we don't know what to expect. And that can be a little bit, that can be a little bit worrying sometimes, Okay. That's right. You never know what's going to happen around that next corner, right? But going back to school, as it invites all those big feelings, right? Like, like being nervous and being excited and all that kind of stuff. And those feelings can be different for everyone. But God is always with us, no matter what it is that we're feeling about it. So if we're excited about it, God is with us. If we're a little bit nervous about it, guess what? God is still with us right? God is still with us. No matter where we go, no matter what we feel, God is with us. And we pray in the Lord's Prayer that God would be with us, right? That His kingdom would come, that His will would be done, and that when all said and done at the end of the day, 
that God would deliver us from evil, that he would deliver us from from sin, that he would deliver us from, from death and harm, that he would deliver us from all the powers of the devil that he might raise against us. And you know how we know that he's going to take care of us? Because he's already done it. He's done it in Jesus, his son, right? Who came to die for us and rose again to new life to make that promise to us as well. And he says, surely I am with you. I am with you even to the end of the age. All your life, I am with you right? And so you guys brought your backpacks in today, and that's good, right? Those backpacks are filled with, well, maybe not right now, but they're filled with blank papers and sharp pencils and fresh new crayons and all sorts of things, yet you don't have anything in it yet. You'll get it in there. You'll, you'll get it in there. That's okay. Okay, well, you'll get some of that stuff in there, but all that stuff is ready to go and ready to start a new school year, new opportunities. And as we get ready to do that, we want to send you off with God's blessing, okay? So rather than pray in our normal way today, I'm going to have you guys get up, right? And you guys stand here in front of me and take your backpacks off your back maybe, right? And hold them up in front of you, all right? And we're going to pray over these backpacks so that as you carry these backpacks with you throughout school, maybe they can remind you and help you to remember that just as your backpack's with you everywhere you go at school, that Jesus is with you too, all right? So let's close our eyes, bow our heads, right? And hold those backpacks up here. Let's pray over those backpacks. Lord of creation and the new creation, last year was different from what we expected. And some of that may still be waiting for us in school this year. But in our backpacks, we carry blank pages, sharpened pencils, pointy crayons, and all sorts of tools to help us learn and grow. There are endless possibilities of what this new year might bring, of what we might learn, who we might meet, and who we might become. And so help us to embrace all of these new possibilities in grace and in faith. Lord, our friend who is always with us, be with us as we head back to school for this year. Be with us as we ride on the bus. Be with us as we walk. Be with us as we buckle seat belts, zip up jackets, and tie shoes. However we get there, whatever we wear, bless us as we work to do the work that you've given us to do at this point in our lives, which is to learn and to grow. Protect us by your grace. Lead us not into temptation so we may avoid sin wherever possible and give us faith to trust in your mercy when we do sin. Help us be brave in our world that we would serve you in good ways and keep all enemies that would stop us from following you at a distance. We thank you for all our teachers, our helpers, our parents, our caregivers and leaders, for all that they do to help us learn and grow. Help us to honor and respect them as they lead us on toward bigger, greater life in the world. Lord, our friend who makes us wonder, fill our hearts, bless our hands. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, thank you guys for coming. You can head on back to your seats. We'll continue now with our hymn of the day.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours today from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know if anybody noticed last week, I didn't say anything about it, but maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Either way, it's here this week, and I will point it out. Uh, There is actually a very small, brief outline that has to do with today's sermon in the bulletin, and so if you are prone to jotting down thoughts or taking notes, uh, that's what that's there for, and I would encourage you to do so. Uh, But all that aside, in one of my classes at seminary, A professor once asked us to write a very short paper answering a very simple question. That question was, according to the Gospel of Luke in the book of Acts, why did Jesus die? Here, this doctor in theology, published in multiple arenas, known as a great modern theologian, chooses as his very first question to a classroom of 30-plus master's level students, why did Jesus die? The quality of a seminary education, everybody. Anyways, the responses came back, though. They were many. They were varied. Jesus died in order to ransom sinners out of the hands of God's enemies and back to himself. Jesus died to to move us, to lead us, to be reconciled with God. Jesus died to to satisfy God's sense of justice so that he is free now to love us sinners once more and several other responses. But what is perhaps more surprising than the question is that we probably spent two full class periods with students, all would-be pastors, offering up answer after answer after answer and being told that they're wrong. Myself included, by the way. Now, they weren't wrong because their answers were false or mistaken. They were actually quite true. But they were wrong because they failed to answer the question that was asked. The question asked was, according to the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, both books were written by Luke, right? Why did Jesus die? And so while all of those answers are correct, if you look at the New Testament as a whole, none of them were correct if you just looked at the witness of St. Luke and what he was trying to tell us about Christ. It was a lesson meant to, to help us all become better readers of the Scriptures, better hearers of the Gospel. And I'll have to say, for for all those seminary students sitting in that classroom, it was a bit of a wake-up call that for all of our knowledge about the Bible or the Christian faith, sometimes, maybe more frequently than we'd like, we don't actually read it all that well because we are so quick to jump to theological conclusions and answers that we have stored up in our mind. In other words, it's not wrong to say that Jesus died to forgive your sins. But the Gospel of Luke never really makes that claim, at least not overtly. He presents a very different answer to that question, why did Jesus die? And it takes some practice to actually sort of get out of those quick, easy answers that we've been taught and just get into the Scripture and read what it says without throwing in what we expect the answer to be from the beginning. And in our text today, Jesus is talking to the crowds about who he is. He's talking to them about his mission. And it's being recounted for us in the Gospel of John, where John is the storyteller. He's using this discourse in order to teach us something about Jesus. Or rather, he's using this discourse to let Jesus tell us something about who he is. And so in the spirit of being better hearers of the gospel, I thought it might serve us well today to to spend some time talking about who Jesus is and what his mission is, specifically as it's given to us by the Apostle John here in his gospel. Now remember, this is part two in a conversation that we're working through right now. Right? Jesus is, is in Capernaum, he's with the crowds who have been following him, and it's been a busy few days for everyone involved. After encountering these huge crowds of people going to great lengths to follow him, Jesus has compassion on them, he teaches them. 
And they're so enraptured by his teaching that everyone loses track of time and thousands of people find themselves hungry in the late hours of the day with no food at all to eat. And so Jesus produces for them this incredible, miraculous feast right there before their eyes out of a simple lunch. And then he sends his disciples out in their boat to cross the sea before he joins them. And he joins them in a miraculous way as well, walking on the water to meet them. After they land, though, the crowds from that feast, they catch up to Jesus. And Jesus rightly deduces that they are following him for the wrong reasons. See, they believe that Jesus is a man of God, that he is sent to satisfy their temporal, worldly needs, like giving them free bread. But he tells them otherwise, which is where we find ourselves today. Because Jesus calls himself the bread of life. Come down from heaven to give life to God's people. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. And whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. So who is Jesus? In his own words, who does Jesus claim to be? Well, first of all, he refers to God in a very special way, different from anyone else. He talks about God as his Father. Now, it's not entirely new. I mean, the Jewish people, they're known for calling God their Father in many ways, but that's kind of a metaphorical thing. Jesus doesn't talk about it like it's a metaphorical relationship. He talks about it in terms of his origins, where he comes from. He says, I have come down from heaven to do the will of my Father. And so who is Jesus? He's the Son of God. The Son of God come into the world. But he doesn't stop there. John's Gospel is actually famous for seven places where Jesus himself uses sort of the divine name, I am, in order to refer to himself, right? And so here he says, I am the bread of life, which satisfies the deepest desires of all mankind. Throughout John's Gospel, he will also call himself by saying, I am the light of the world, Meaning, I am the righteous God that drives away the darkness that covers you and obscures your path. He says, I am the door to God. I am the means by which men and women have access to Him and all of the prophesied promises that He gives to His people. He says, I am the good shepherd. I'm the loving leader, the protector of God's people, directing them to where they can find all that they need and driving away all of the enemies that would threaten his people. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. A bold statement, if ever there was one. He actually claims to be the source of all life in the world and therefore also the source of all new life. The end of death itself. And if anyone doubted his urgency, he calls himself the way, the truth, and the life, arguing that there is no other path by which humanity can seek God and find God. As the Son of God who came down from heaven, from God his Father, to do his will, Jesus is the only true expression and revelation of what lies beyond our senses. And lastly, Jesus says that he is the vine onto which all of humanity is grafted. He is the the animus, the source, the power, the life force for all humanity. And only through him can we ever hope to find goodness in our lives, to produce good fruit, to do good works, and that unbelief, Lack of faith, lack of trust in Jesus, as all of these things for you cuts you off from that vine. Cuts you off from the way, the truth, the life, the resurrection, the loving shepherd, the door, the light. Cuts you off from the bread of life. Cuts you off from the Son of the living God. That is who Jesus is. 
straight from the horse's mouth. But then why did he come? Again, in his own words, what is his mission? What is his purpose for coming down from heaven in the first place? Well, throughout John's Gospel, Jesus speaks of a people. He speaks of a community that lives and exists in the world and yet belongs to God. And Jesus is God's way of of drawing that people out of the world and drawing them to himself. Jesus' mission is to teach God's people about him, to teach them about the life that he's calling them to. He is a leader of God's people. He's guiding them through life in the world. But not everyone is a part of that people. And so Jesus says that part of his mission is to actually help sort that out, to sort out who is and who is not, to draw out that distinction and so announce judgment upon those who are not a part of God's people. He talks about the world as if it is a doomed thing, obsessed with itself and all of its fleeting glory, fated for an end. And so Jesus also talks about the need for deliverance, the need for salvation, both for God's people and for the world itself. So his mission is also accomplishing that salvation which he does by laying down his own life for God's people in order to deliver them from their enemies. And through all of this, he points to a last day, an end to this current age of the world, when Jesus is going to raise up God's people to live with him for eternity. And your connection to Jesus and all of this great work that he does for you, your connection is faith. It's trust that Jesus is who he says he is and that Jesus does what he came to do. But faith, trust, it's not always easy. I mean, Jesus makes some pretty bold claims, amazingly bold, in fact. And people make bold claims all the time. Someone on TV says he's got the cure for cancer in a forgotten medicinal herb that the pharmaceutical companies don't want you to know about. But it can be yours for $39.95. Someone on the internet claims that the President of the United States is a Satan-worshipping lizard person from outer space, and we all have a responsibility to rise up in arms against him. I heard from my uncle that the Gulf War was justified by the government based on a false testimony by Middle Eastern agents, and so perhaps should have never happened. My university history professor told me that Jesus wasn't a real person at all. He was a myth created by mashing up a handful of different mythologies out of the ancient world. Eastern philosophy, well, that says that reality is all an illusion. That your duty in life is to somehow rise above the illusion, to to reach a higher awareness of existence. And here, Jesus of Nazareth says he is the Son of God, sent from heaven by the one true God in order to call, to gather, and to enlighten God's people in the world so that he might raise them up on the last day to live for eternity. All of these claims are bold. So what makes Jesus' bold claims true? Well, the men and women in that crowd that Jesus was talking to, they doubted his claims. Jesus said, I am the Son of God, come down from heaven. But they knew Jesus. And they knew that he was the son of Joseph and Mary, come down from Nazareth. Their grumbling wasn't really about skepticism, though. It was because... They only thought they knew the story. They thought they knew Jesus' origins. They thought they understood everything. See, they knew that Joseph was Jesus' father, but they didn't know that he was Jesus' adopted father. 
They didn't know about the angel Gabriel's message to both Mary and Joseph, that this one, that they would name Jesus, would be conceived by the Holy Spirit, that he would be born of a virgin. They weren't privy to those details at all, and so all they saw was a man claiming to be something that he clearly was not. And as the story unfolds, it turns out that this claim to be the Son of God is the principal thing that Jesus tries to say about himself throughout the Gospel of John, and it is also the very thing that would lead to his death. As we'll see next week, people rejected him because of this teaching. They turned their backs, they walked away from him because of this teaching. And as you read on in John's Gospel, you see that every time he repeats that claim, he does it six more times at least, the people get angrier and angrier until they decide that these aren't just innocent claims anymore. They're dangerous. They're heretical. They need to be silenced. They need to be punished. This claim that Jesus is the Son of God, this is the principal way that he talks about himself throughout this gospel. It is the primary reason also given for why they killed him. Jesus dies because of his bold claims. But Jesus doesn't stay dead. See, whatever you've heard about Jesus' resurrection before, what it means, what it does, Hear this here today. There are many people who make bold claims before, and they've been dead wrong. But occasionally it turns out that they're 100% correct. But the only way to ever know the difference is by waiting until the end of the story. The crowds that Jesus goes back and forth with in Capernaum, they don't know the end of the story. They're still in the middle of it. But someday, many of them likely get to hear about the end, and you and I, we certainly have heard about the end of this story. And that ending makes all of the difference. Because you see, if Jesus died on the cross, and he was buried in the tomb, and he stayed there, it proves that he was just some crazy dude with crazy ideas. But the fact that Jesus doesn't stay there The fact that he rises from the dead, that he takes his life back up again, that he has physical, living encounters with people after his death means that every bold claim that he makes should get another look. See, Jesus' resurrection proves that he was right all along, not just in some of the claims that he made, but in all of the claims that he made. Jesus' resurrection vindicates him from all doubt, proving that he truly is the bread of life that satisfies all needs for eternity. It vindicates his claim to be the living bread come down from heaven, the very Son of the living God sent to this world on a mission to call and to gather God's people to himself. And that includes you. In Jesus, you get to see and experience God, and through him, you are reconciled to God. A lot of people say a lot of things, but they're either dead and long in the ground, or they will be there someday, and there they will stay. Jesus says a lot of things for you, too, but no grave could contain him. He lives today. He lives, and that is the primary reason why you can and should trust in every bold claim that he makes. He's the Son of the living God. Indeed, God himself for you, sent from heaven to lead you, to teach you, to call you into God's holy people, to save you, to lay down his life for you to raise you up on the last day. And may the peace that passes all understanding guard your heart and mind in, in all that he says, in all that he promises, until that last day comes. Amen.
invite you to rise as we confess our faith today using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now pray for all the people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We thank you, Lord, for our daily bread, for all that we need in this body and life. Grant us hearts so moved to give as you have first given to us for the needs of others and in support of the work of your kingdom. Through your means of grace, keep us always fed with the grace and mercy of your Son, the living bread from heaven. Lord, in your mercy. As your servant Elijah fled out of fear and was fed and nourished by you, Come to us in our times of fear and anxiety that we would be fed with what lasts and sustains in our times of need. Be especially with those we name before you now, including Marcia Senkush, Denny Fozzi, the son-in-law of Karen Eck, Denise and Harley, family of Chuck and Bernice Anderson, Lily Layton, Jeannie Schutte, Corbin Sietzma, and Braden Martin, fiancé of Jenna Pearson, who was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Grant peace and healing, hope and health, according to your will. Lord, in your mercy. As Jesus continued to teach the people of his day to know and to see him as he is, grant that we continually learn of your love through him as our Savior. Guide children, parents, families, and individuals to rejoice in your word here and in their homes, that all would be fed with your life-giving grace through the work of your Spirit. Lord, in your mercy. Be with all the families of this congregation and all that are connected to them. May the blessings that you have made known to your people be realized in our homes and overflow to all those whom we touch. We especially lift before you Myron, Michelle, Brooke, and Zachary Meadows, Mike and Wanda Medina, Mitch and Sally Mewborn. We also ask that you would bless all parents and children as they get ready to resume school this week, that all would fulfill their vocations to you and to one another in faith. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We now bring forward our tithes and our offerings.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who, having created all things, took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake he died on the cross and rose from the dead to put an end to death, thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise.
Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through this same gift in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. May be seated for a few quick announcements. Although, before we get to that, um, I have to apologize. I forgot something in the prayers today. Um, Marianne, the situation is still the same? Um, first, I'd like to hear you before the prayers. I mean, that anyway, and our little baby Ellen, 
Fantastic. Praise God. Praise Jesus for that. That is awesome. Um, however, we are going to continue to pray for him, so let's do that right now. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your provision uh, for Elliot this past week. Um, uh, infant, only two months old, Lord, uh, so, so weak and so new to this world and already uh, suffering with some of the, the, the struggles that we face of sickness and, uh, and illness in this world. Uh, but Lord, you have provided uh, you have been with him and with his family, Lord. You have been with the doctors and the nurses. We know this, and we just praise you that things seem to be headed in a better direction, uh, that he seems to be doing better and is, uh, will hopefully be able to, uh, to join his family and return home in good health uh, as soon as possible. And so we just ask, Lord, that you would continue what you have already done, that you would be with him and his family in all things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. Yeah, that's the problem with writing things on post-its and not with the other stuff, is I just completely look over the post-it and not pay attention to things. So, glad we got a chance to do that. I'm super glad to hear that things are going better. All right, uh, announcements. Let's see here. Uh, oh, that's another thing I'll share real quick. Um, uh, you know, we talk about timing and how things work out sometimes and how God works in the world. Um, when I found out that we were going to be doing the, the, the start of school and backpack blessing uh, was the same day that we were ending the Lord's Prayer with deliver us from evil. And I was like, oh, well, that's neat. I kind of you know, can fit that together. That works, right? Uh, we also talked today about bold claims made by Jesus and made by others in the world. And actually today in our Bible class, we're going to be talking about some of those bold claims that other people make against against Christianity and against uh, our faith and uh, the teachings of Scripture, the teachings of Jesus himself, um, especially some that were raised popularly in the Da Vinci Code and uh, books like it, uh, but also um, some of the claims made by even some of our supposed scholars and theologians of the Bible. And so um, it just so happens that, again, in our study today on how we got the Bible, we're going to talk about some of those claims made by others, and we get to sort of see what it is that they're saying and, uh, and kind of talk about uh, why Jesus is so much greater than all of the, the, the claims that they're making. So uh, if, even if you haven't been a part of it, I encourage you, come and join us today. Uh, be part of that discussion. Uh, that being said, we've got a couple of dates of note coming up. Um, next Sunday, <clears throat> August 15th, following the late service, we're going to have an information meeting about our first communion instruction and confirmation preparation. And so anyone with unconfirmed children ages 10 and up I was encouraged to come and be a part of that meeting, unless they were at the meeting last year. If you were at the meeting last year, it's the same information. But if you haven't, uh, be here now. And so if you know of someone who isn't here and you're like, oh, they should probably hear about this, make sure to pass that word along to them next Sunday following the late service. And if they can't make that, have them contact me uh, so that we can talk to them about what's going on. And then two weeks from today, um, which I say is Sunday, August 21st, but it's not the 21st, it's the 22nd. So, uh, it's bad on my part. Uh, we will be having our first planning meeting for next summer's National Youth Gathering, which will be held in Houston, Texas. And so, again, anyone who has high school-aged youth, uh, meaning high school this year, whether it's freshmen all the way through senior, if they're, they're graduating this year, doesn't matter. Um, they get to come. And so, uh, please, uh, youth with parents, uh, make sure to be at that meeting, uh, again, August 22nd, following the late service. Um, we've talked a bit about our Life Light Bible study that we're hoping to kick off in September. Still looking for help if people would like to serve as uh, small group facilitators as part of that, or even uh, to help out with child care so that some of our younger families uh, can be a part of that uh, study. And so um, hopefully maybe, I'm thinking maybe next week or so, I'll have a little bit more information. We can actually start sign-ups for participants. Uh, but in the meantime, again, if you would like to serve in one of those capacities, I encourage you to reach out and let me know. Uh, we continue uh, gauging interest in holding a blood drive here at Faith. Uh, if you are in a place where you would be able to give, maybe sometime starting in September, uh, there's a sign-up sheet out there. Just, you know, write your name. You don't have to fill in all the other information about best time and phone numbers or whatever else, but just write your name on it so we have an idea of people who would be willing and able to do that. Uh, that way we can pass that information on and they can decide whether or not it's worth it. I hate to say it that way, but yeah, whether or not it's worth it to come out here and hold the blood drive at all. So again, please let us know. Uh, and as we sent out an email to that effect also this week, uh, you can just reply to that email and let us know as well. Uh, either way, we'll do the job. 
Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Oh, new issue of the Lutheran Witness magazine is out for this month. There's some copies out there. Uh, also, when you go to the magazine rack, there's a table, the usher table out in front of it. There's a couple of old issues that I'm about ready to throw out, and so if anybody wants to take one of those and just take them home with you, that's fine. Otherwise, I'll recycle them and do what we will. Um, that's all I have in terms of announcements. I don't know if anybody else has anything to share here this morning. All righty. Well then, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.